Inform Choice Radio, episode 490, Self-Nourishment to Feed Your Professional Soul with Dr. Alka Patel. Live, Live from Sundial House Studios, this is Informed Choice Radio. Radio. Want to make the most of your money and your life? You've, You've come, come to, to the, the right, right place. place. Now, here's your host, your host. Martin Bamford. We could all do with a little self-nourishment right now. My guest on the podcast today is Dr. Alka Patel. Alka is a GP, lifestyle medicine physician and health coach. She's been a medical doctor for more than 20 years, but realised her professional career meant her own health was being placed on the back burner. The resulting burnout left Alka in a hospital bed. Alka discovered the hard way that her career in isolation wasn't supplying her with the energy, resilience, strength and happiness she needed and that prioritising her health was by far the most important thing she needed to do to help her career flourish. According to Alka, creativity, productivity and longevity are all achieved when you give yourself the self-nourishment you need to feed your professional soul. So here's my conversation with Dr Alka Patel in episode 490 of Informed Choice Radio. Welcome to Informed Choice Radio. Perhaps you could start by introducing yourself to tell us a little bit about you and about what it is you do. Hi, Martin. So um, I guess uh, let me just start, I think, by saying that this is actually my first guest podcast. So this is really going to hold quite a special place in my memory bank for me. So I'm really delighted to be here. So thank you. So yeah, so I'm Alka um, and I've been a GP for a long time. 20 years, in fact. Yeah, I think for nearly all of those years, being a GP has really been sort of part of my identity. So it's sort of been my compass, my direction. But interestingly, exactly this time last year, I actually realized that I'd sort of lost that sense of identity. I felt I wasn't being the doctor I wanted to be. I noticed that I was seeing that revolving door of general practice, patients sort of constantly coming back, more symptoms, and this real sort of increased dependency on me for my prescriptions and my advice, but no real sense that there was any real long-term gain, which is what I wanted for them. So I felt something needed to be different. And so one day, I just made a really big, bold decision to leave my partnership. And I didn't really have a plan B, just that I needed to explore something different. And so the day after I left my partnership, I got on a plane all alone, which I hadn't actually done before. And I went off to a part of India where I'd never been before and where I didn't speak the language, in fact. And I did some voluntary work. And again, I'd never done voluntary work like this um, before. Um, And I did it in palliative care. So it was looking after patients at the end of their lives in all the remote villages um, around Kerala. And I think for me, what I saw was a different type of healthcare. I saw a lot of kindness and compassion in communities. I saw people using their own tools and their own sort of internal resources to look after their health. And so despite poverty, I saw happy people. Mm. And so my bubble really did burst. I sort of felt I'd regrounded. And when I came back to the UK, I knew something really did have to be different. And that's really when I discovered lifestyle medicine. So why why do you think that there is something, I guess, missing from traditional uh, medicine, traditional uh, health services in the UK, and and that you as a GP in in that practice for 20 years, couldn't find that sense of identity, couldn't find that, I guess, compassionate approach to to medicine? We often hear about doctors' bedside manners, don't we? And and, and sometimes we feel doctors, our interaction with them is quite standoffish and and maybe not as uh, sensitive and and well-connected as it's supposed to be. What What's missing? Well, I mean, I think there is a huge amount of compassion in the in the profession. In fact, so much so that sometimes what we lose is our self compassion um, as doctors um, for ourselves, because there really is this big sense of of give in the profession, a sense of altruism, and and we continue and we continue. But I think what we try and do really hard is we we hold on to health for other people. We feel like we're the owners of their health, and actually it's patients, it's not doctors who are the managers of their own health. And I think this is really the sort of missing link. And Mm. I think that's why I discovered lifestyle medicine. It's really what I call sort of 
common sense medicine. We seem to have lost that sense of common sense medicine, self-care medicine, almost sort of DIY medicine where we give health back to to patients. So, so how, how would we describe lifestyle medicine? I can sort of take a, a, a guess at what that might involve, but what, what are some of the elements involved? Yeah, no, that's sort of really, um, really interesting question because sort of the word lifestyle gets used quite a lot, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think even for me to help myself unravel this, what I did in the last year was I I created what I call a blueprint um, for what I really believe are the true sort of key roots of health and happiness. And this is what lifestyle medicine is based on. It's taking us back to the roots of our health. And so I've called this blueprint the lifestyle first method. And with that, each letter of the word lifestyle is connected to a really key aspect of our lifestyles that we've actually got control over and choice over. And I think that's the critical part. So um, L is life's purpose, I is identity, F is food, E is exercise, S is sleep, T is time out, Y is your connections, L is learning habits, and E is is emotion. So if you take all of those individual pieces, when you start to talk about health and what matters in health, actually you can hook so much of it. In fact, pretty much all of it every time I come across a question, I can hook it onto one of those 10 key routes. And so that's what lifestyle medicine for me is all about. So with my patients, when I now see them, I simply ask them to tell me their health story. And Mm. I just listen with this really intent curiosity. And it really is quite fascinating because people don't often have the opportunity to just say their story, how it feels to them. And and each of those elements within your lifestyle first method, do they they carry equal weight to somebody's health and happiness or are there bits which are more important than, than others? No, not at all. I think there's, you know, there is a real science behind this as well. So um, in terms of sort of research and evidence, there's plenty of information about all of those key roots and all of them playing a part. I don't think you can pull out one from the other. And I don't think you can say that one is more more predominant because sometimes there are aspects missing that we don't recognize. We think, you know, I'm, I'm eating well every day and I exercise all the time. And why is it that I'm still feeling anxious or upset and and actually you need to find one of the other routes that that may be responsible so i think there's a part of all of it um for all of us really and look you know medication surgery all of that plays a really important part in in medicine but i think when you come to what to focus on in terms of actions Mm -hmm. we tend to revert to those quick fixes first but actually thinking about that lifestyle focus is really really important and it's about sort of self-care again it's showing patients that there are actions that they can take that have got an evidence base that isn't about doing things that you don't understand it's about actually there are actions that you can take that make a massive difference to how you feel and how you live what what would some of the i guess quick wins be if you you have a typical patient comes to you and and you work through that that program with them what what are the areas they say to you you know those made the biggest immediate impact on my life Oh wow, gosh, that's uh, that's an, it's really in, individualized. So yeah. um, I talk a lot about mindset. So it's about sort of changing your mindset into not necessarily just being positive, but really kind of thinking about what are other ways that I can look at this situation. Um, and so, for example, if you're somebody that says, you know, I want to. Um, be more healthy or the simple practice of a daily affirmation that says I am healthy or I am energetic or I am in charge makes a big difference our thoughts become become our actions and you know Mm -hmm. these sound like small things that you can do but actually the wins from those are huge and it is about building habits that make a difference into your into your every day one of the first things i do um, actually with most of my patients is we talk about sort of life's values and life's meaning and what matters to people and people again you know don't give themselves enough headspace or time to think about their own sort of personal values but i tell you artin once you've figured that out and it's not an easy thing to do but once you've even had a conversation about it you can then start bringing back everything you do in your normal day to that. It's, it's amazing. Really, really is. 
how does our health and happiness, I guess, link into all the other areas of our life? Because it's obviously not something we can view in isolation. It's it's everything in a sense, isn't it? It's 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 what we are and what how we feel each day, and and that must have ramifications for our performance in areas like our careers. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know there is a big connection um, between our careers and um, and our health. It's also intertwined, isn't it? I guess our careers. What do they provide us? They provide. They provide us a lot of things. I mean, of course, they provide us financial sustenance, don't they? And financial sustenance isn't always a thing that buys us happiness. So it gives us choice and it means that we can then do all the things that kind of feel of value and meaning to us. And so I guess if you can then combine that financial planning with health and vitality, you're on to kind of living a really well-lived life, aren't you? So um, it's pretty logical. If your health burns then your career is going to burn. If your health takes a nosedive, your business is going to take a nosedive. But the problem is most of us think our lifestyles should happen after work So, um, because we're far too busy at work to think about our health. But actually, how much of our life do we spend Mm -hmm. at work or working? It's probably over 50%, I would say. Um, So it's not about I go to the gym after work, but actually you sat all day long in front of the computer screen without standing up for nine hours. It's not about, you know, I'll have a meal when I get home and actually you've not eaten all day at work because of back-to-back meetings. It's not, oh, I'm going to answer my emails late into the early hours or during the weekdays, but I'll catch up on my sleep at the weekends. All these things make a big impact. And actually, they also impact on your productivity, your efficiency, your creativity, your memory, your concentration, all of this, which is important for us in our working lives as well. So things like, you know, getting up from your desk at lunchtime, taking a proper lunch break, getting a daily step count in throughout the day, these are all really important. Yeah. And easily done. Again, we don't prioritize them, so we don't think about think about doing them. Um, so I often, when I'm sort of talking to businesses and organizations, I like to leave them with a sort of lifestyle first menu, which are just 15 minutes of that working day of things that you can do on a daily basis and that you can do with other people. And um, so simple things might be Mindful Monday, so 15 minutes of relaxing breathing exercises as a team together. Tone Up Tuesday. So again, 15 minutes of simple workplace office-based movement. You don't need Lycra for it. Um, Walking Wednesday. So everybody out for a 15-minute walk together, get that sunlight. Thankful Thursday, thinking about, you know, 15 minutes you spend together, about things that you're really grateful for at work. And Foodie Friday, though, why don't we all bring in food together, share company together and enjoy what we're eating rather than gnashing at that sandwich in front of the computer screen. It sounds so simple. Mm. So why don't we do it? <laughs> no, no. And now you've said that and, and given each of those days a name like that, it, you're absolutely right. It's so simple. And, and why why do more employers not do that and and bring that in when it's it's easy to incorporate within their lives? Alka, you mentioned earlier a sense of control. Um, I guess many of us feel that a lot of these factors, these lifestyle factors are outside of our control because we live increasingly busy lives. Um, you know, we struggle with the, the discipline, I guess, to stick to diets, to stick to exercise regimes. How, how do we feel a greater sense of control around these issues? I think, again, it's back to that initial conversation we had about purpose, you know, that mm-hmm. self sort of sustaining sense of sense of meaning. And if you have got a really good sense of purpose, you're going to feel that your choices are your own um, rather than things being sort of imposed outwardly um, on you. So I think that's a really um, important way of doing it because it's your purpose that's going to drive your your choices, whether you choose to go out for 15 minutes of sunlight or not, it's, you know, your own sense of identity is going to determine that. Your own sense of how important is my health to me because I want to stay healthy to travel and see the world, or I want to stay healthy for my family, or I want to stay healthy so I can continue to earn earn money for my children. It really is about what is that, again, meaning um, for you, really. Um, And I think, you know, again, there's research that says having that a strong sense of purpose in life, actually, it's not, it adds years to your life and life to your years. There actually is an increased lifespan for having that sense of sort of directive, valued based living. Not easy, but I think, you know, definitely worthy of some pause and headspace in our lives to to think about. Mm. Uh, and how, how would purpose differ from goals? Because I know we're all very good, particularly at the start of each year of setting our, our goals for the year ahead, our resolutions, you know, we're going to lose 40 pounds, we're going to go to a gym three times a week. But, but goals are different, aren't they, from purpose? 
Yeah, oh no, absolutely. So goals, um, I think, are very much about the specifics, aren't they? They're the measurable things that you can do. You kind of know when you've achieved your your goals. Um, and for me, I think the difference between goals and purpose is purpose is your why and goals is your is your how. Um, so maybe in really simple simple terms, if I sort of try and illustrate this with me, for me, my my very simple purpose that I'm able to try and wrap everything around is to share and to care. That's it in its in its really, really simplest form. And I guess in business terms, we often think about the sort of the mission of the organization, don't we? So what's that sort of bigger, bigger mission? But in order to fulfill that purpose, goals are really useful. So one of my goals in order to fulfill my purpose of sharing and caring was actually to be a guest on a podcast episode. And and here I am. And the reason I'm here is because this is back to being core to what matters to me. And Mm. so your goal can actually be part of your purpose. But the difficulty is that a lot of the time, we don't set our goals in line with anything. And so goals can feel sort of meaningless and that sense of I want to, you know, want to lose weight. And you don't think about why. So doing that 21 day challenge in the gym or, you know, eating just celery for a whole week, it doesn't reach that purpose because you haven't thought about the why. You've got to the what you're going to do, but not thought about why, really why you're doing it. And I think that's the that's the difference really, isn't it? How does this change as we get older? And many of the clients we deal with as financial planners are at retirement or just into their retirement, so in their 60s or 70s or even older. Mm. Do these lifestyle factors and, and your approach, does it change for older people and people who have who have stopped working, maybe have a lot more leisure time, free time on their hands? I don't think so, Martin. I think actually um, the principles are exactly the same. The you know the depth, the extent, it's all very individualised, isn't it? Um, mm. And as I said, in terms of again, we keep coming back to purpose in this in our chat, but you know that does add years to life and life to years at whatever stage in life you're at. And there's research that shows that it applies as much to the younger population as to the to the older population. Moving every day is critically important as we as we get older, and the focus maybe needs to change to things like balance exercises so that if you are if you do fall you're less likely to have an injury you'll need to change your focus to more agility based exercises to build your flexibility so the principles are still there in terms of sort of what's um, what's important so i don't think that necessarily changes i don't think you have to feel that you you can't continue to make changes in, in your lifestyles as you get older. And Alka, before I let you go, I couldn't possibly speak to a doctor today on the podcast without asking you about coronavirus and what's going on. I'm not sure when this episode will air. So obviously it's a, a fluid situation. It's changing on a daily basis. So I won't ask for anything specific around it. But for people, um, particularly people being asked to self-isolate, stay within their homes in close proximity to their families for extended periods of time, what are some of the things they need to think about just to preserve their physical health and also their mental health during that time? Yeah, no, absolutely. So again, it's a, a little bit about mindset, isn't it? And a, cont- maintaining that sense of of calm um, throughout. And again, we talked about control, but thinking about all the things that you can control rather than focusing on all the what ifs and the things that you can't control. Um, and actually, you know, is there a silver lining with every cloud? Is this time with your family that you're able to spend that you might not have been able to otherwise? Is this time to engage in reading at home and playing board games with your with your family? that you haven't in having those conversations that we don't get a chance to have let's find out from each other in our families what matters to you what's important to you so I think people can still do that certainly in terms of sort of um, eating food etc you know yes eat healthy nutritious whole food that will provide you with all those sort of immune boosting properties foods that's high in vitamin c and zinc which is found in Fruits and vegetables, that really is, you know, very much about sort of eating eating the rainbow. Movement, as I said, we don't need to necessarily be going to the gym to find movement. We can move within our own homes. We can create sort of things that we can do as families together in terms of family um, family movement. I think that social connection side is really important because the thing that defies us, that defines us as human beings is social connection. Um, and to be able to maintain that, whether, you know, through different formats that we may not have been, been used to before, the telephone, 
FaceTime, using the technology to our advantage, really. I know it's much harder for the elderly population, but again, thinking about that person down the road to you who could do with it with a phone call is really, really important. And our sense of health and our sense of happiness usually does come from doing something for others that is bigger than than ourselves. So it's just keeping that that in mind. Uh, I think what you just said there about there being a silver lining in every cloud, it's its really now got to be the case of looking for those silver linings and yeah. making the most of a, a difficult situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Agree. Alka, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Before I let you go, um, how can we find out more about your work? I know you have online coaching programs too. So, so how can we find out more about you and connect with you? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Wow. Um, lots of ways. So in fact, I've just launched my own podcast as well, which is called the Lifestyle First Podcast. So that's on Apple and Spotify uh, for people to tune into. My website's a really good place to connect with me. So that's www dot alkapatel.com so lots of info on there about my work and my consultations my coaching workplace well-being as well um, so just hop on there book a free call with me um, social media as well I'm on all the usual social media channels and in fact I'm charting my own 365 day lifestyle journey which um, people might be sort of interested in so that's at Dr Alka Patel UK as well and my practice is based in in Elstree and you can find me there as well Brilliant. We'll make sure in our show notes for this episode, we put links to the podcast and to your website and social media and, and, and ways people can get in touch with you. But it's been a pleasure to chat. Thank you so much for your time today. And I hope your, um, your first podcast guest appearance wasn't too painful. I hope it went okay for you. Absolutely. I am still smiling. So no, thank you very much. Um, I'm amazed at how quickly that went, but fantastic. Thank you so much. I had a great morning. Okay. Thank you. A big thank you to Alka for joining me for this episode. I really, really enjoyed that conversation, particularly at this time when I think looking after ourselves, putting our health and our happiness first is so important. It's always been important, of course, but the coronavirus crisis and this lockdown situation has really highlighted the need to look after ourselves a bit better, our physical health and also our mental well-being too. So thank you, Alka, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Remember, you can find show notes and useful links for this episode on our website at icradio.co.uk if you enjoyed listening which i hope you did please do leave us a rating and review in your favorite podcast player and until next time i'm martin bamford and this is informed choice radio and remember when it comes to your money the more you know the faster it can grow